everything was like trial and error at the hospital because they didn't know it was like, what is this? He's made an impact on so many lives, but why can't he still be here to continue that impact? LJ was special and he can never be replaced. He is one of a kind. We refer to him as the man, the myth, the legend. LJ, my big fella. LJ was 28. He had Down syndrome. He was my oldest son, my oldest child, my only son. LJ was a ball of energy. He was always doing something. They traveled a lot. They just basically used every opportunity that they could to explore the world with LJ. He loved playing flag football, soccer, baseball. He was in the book club. He did the Down syndrome calendar. God was obviously preparing us for this because he was doing a little bit of everything. And it was right up until, you know, COVID really came into our community is that they were, you know, still going out and um, enjoying their time together. Even though we didn't understand all the ins and outs of COVID, it affects the Down syndrome community because not all of their immune systems are in the best of health or they're easily compromised. LJ worked for Mosaic Day Services. It was just a group of volunteers who work with a lot of the restaurants in the area to help supply like herbs, you know, any type of vegetable. October 18th, we got a message saying that they were shutting the job down because someone may have been exposed to COVID. On the 19th of October, I had the three of us go get tested. Michaela and I are tested negative. LJ tested positive. She told me that his symptoms just weren't bad enough for him to be admitted into the hospital. He did okay for the first couple of days, but the doctor said that the vomiting and the diarrhea were the normal part of COVID. So, you know, just keep an eye out for the excessive breathing and for the shortness of breath. And he didn't have those. About day eight, I was finally able to get him to eat some hot sickles and drink some broth and thought, you know, okay, well, he should be okay from here. With LJ testing positive, I said, well, I better go back and test. I retested on the 26th. Got up that morning to take care of him, went in, and he was sleeping. And so I just kind of whispered, LJ, LJ, because he'd had a rough night the night before. So, um, I touched him and he felt kind of cold. And then I started checking for a pulse and a heartbeat. And um, I kind of went into panic mode and finally called 911. And unfortunately, he ended up passing away on October 27th. I guess that was, that was the end of my baby. <laughs> We miss him. We miss his spirit. I miss him, you know, asking me how I'm doing, if I'm tired, what I'm cooking for dinner, just the little things coming in to give me a kiss before he left for work. He was always wanting to know what I was doing, making sure that I was okay. He passed that morning on the 27th, and I found out that evening that I tested positive. So I'm having to wait another two weeks in quarantine before I could even go to the funeral home to have him buried. For Tamala, LJ was her whole world. You could just tell that a piece of her was gone. And His room with the door was like always open and everything. And like, it's just weird not seeing him at home and 
you think he's coming back home later, but no. LJ and his sister were really close. He and Michaela are like best buddies. During the interview, they were wearing shirts that said extra love. They became advocates for LJ beyond his life. I purchased the extra love shirts to let people know that I lost a loved one with special needs. Just because you feel like it's your right to go out without a mask on, and it is, but why not protect those who are the most vulnerable to us? It's not going to hurt them to get vaccinated. I was happy to get vaccinated. I tried to wait as long as I could to donate convalescent plasma. But, you know, I said, well, I should be coming around to the end of my antibodies. So let me go ahead and take care of myself and get myself vaccinated. So that way I don't pass it on to anyone else. I think that she really, the family really struggles with him not being around and filling up space, you know, with that love and joy and light that he always had. And I didn't realize, you know, how many lives he touched until he passed. He knew no strangers. He knew no judgment. A lot of people said whenever I was having a bad day and I saw him, it brought a smile to my face and it ended that bad day. Everybody loved him. The pop-up garden is dedicating their learning circle to him. And we just learned that Bellevue is going to name a bench in honor of him down at one of our local parks. They're making it an all-inclusive park to accommodate the kids with disabilities. He's made an impact on so many lives, but why can't he still be here to continue that impact? Tamala told me she has good and bad days, and I don't think you'll ever be able to get over the fact that you lost a loved one so close to you. But I think there is a point where you can memorialize them, I guess, in a way where it's not so much painful, but a little bit more, you know, remembering their life and who they were. I think our favorite memory is him doing the Rise Up Runway show with Creighton University. He just thought he was a supermodel. He just had that personality that lit up the room. Him and his sister got to walk down the runway and he just stole the show. And I get tickled, you know, every time I see videos that she's uh, done with him. And I'm like, you've been holding out on all the videos that you had of him. And it's just them, I guess, doing what sisters and brothers do and um, singing and, and dancing. He loved to dance. <laughs> yes, he did. I, I think he's up in heaven dancing right now. He landed in the hospital. It, everything was like trial and error at the hospital because they didn't know it was like, what is this? Here in New Orleans, Keith Carter and his wife, Stephanie, were living a good life. Mr. Keith had never had any prior illnesses. He was never in the hospital before. And then come March of 2020, he's feeling sick. It was just all downhill from there. Mr. Keith tested positive for COVID. He ended up having a stroke. And Miss Stephanie, she had to turn into not only just being his wife cheerleader, but also being his life cheerleader. Steph's first husband, he had cancer and he died. My first wife had multiple sclerosis. We were married 20 years. She died in 2003. I prayed for another wife and God showed me Steph. You know, it was like, this is a second chance. And, you know, when I thought I was losing him, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my second husband. I'm like, God, I said, you know, you gave me this gift and I can't lose this gift. By March 9th is when I started feeling problems. I was weak. I had a headache. I had a temperature. I also had COVID at the same time. I was quarantined the same house with him. He was worse off than me, bad headaches and everything. It was like, let's try to fight this thing and do what we have to do to get ourselves together. But it didn't work. There was one morning when everything just was going haywire. And so they called EMS. When he went to the hospital, they confirmed that he ended up having a stroke. Everything was acute from the kidneys, the lungs, the heart. It was like a bomb went into his body. And I spent almost two and a half months at UMC. My vocal cord, they diagnosed as being paralyzed. 
on one side. In the beginning, I was so out of it. He had ICU delirium, and I was like going crazy in the house. All I could do is just pray, thank God, because you know I was able to Zoom in with the doctors because I couldn't go there. I read so much and I learned so much before I even asked the doctors questions. They were like, how do you know about Thorsen Tesis? Are you a nurse? And I'm like, no. We have a lot of people in our family, doctors, nurses, PTs, OTs. So we kind of like consulted with them. And I kid you not, I have a, a notebook with you for UMC, about as big as this. Conversations, the times, the dates, you name it, it's in there. I could write a book. But some things, you know, they could really couldn't tell me about the COVID. After he got out of the hospital, he went to Toro Rehab Center. It's where I learned a lot of things all over again. How to brush my teeth, how to walk, how to dress myself, and things of that nature. Really just being independent. For Mr. Keats to be able to come home was such a big deal for him, his family, his friends, people who knew him, because they didn't know if he would actually be able to be back home. That was his welcome home, Mr. Keith, drive-by parade celebration that they had. Balloons, cards, you name it, people were just pulling up. I was amazed myself. Man, the street was full. All of my friends and family, it was so touching, man, because you didn't know what I was able to see was all the people that had been praying for me. Almost a year later, I wanted to do a follow-up for Mr. Keith because I wanted to tell something that was inspiring to people, but also reminded them of how, you know, impactful this virus really can be for somebody as well as their family. When I transferred home, I went into what's, what's called outpatient therapy. They work with my arm, my legs, and my speech. Miss Stephanie, who was gone from, you know, just his best friend and partner to now a caregiver as well. She sent me videos and said, look, he's walking by himself. And I was like, oh my gosh, look at him go. Yes, yes, yes. After this happened, Stephanie had to recreate her whole life, how she went about her day to day, making sure her schedule fit into his therapy schedules, making sure the house was safe for him to be able to move around to practice walking from the living room to the kitchen, being that support system that he needed to know that he was doing great. I mean, she's an excellent caregiver. And I thank, I thank God for having her as a wife because, you know, she's constantly on me. And I get to, you get to the point where you're like, hey, shut up, leave me alone. But she is, is her love that keeps her going. He told me he was very motivated by having his family around him. He has certainly come a long way from the very first time we spoke. Now, I'm still walking with a bit of a limp, but at least I am balanced enough to do some walking. Going for walks, he and Miss Stephanie do quite often. He rides his bike all the time, she says. He's always tossing a ball. And Mr. Keith is now vaccinated. They're ready to get back to their festivals and their fun. Any festival you name, but Jazz Fest is the best. And not only that, we love Mardi Gras. See, Endymion, oh my gosh. The sooner everyone cracks down and does what they're supposed to do, they said the sooner we will be able to get back to what we love. At the hospital, I asked nurses and doctors, how do you put up with all of this? All this negative you see, they say, you just don't see the miracles. Everybody doesn't get up, everybody doesn't change, but it gave me that hope. Don't take life for granted because like, this is the first pandemic in my life, you know, at my age. People see life different now. 